On the evening of April 20th, 2018, a woman named Bernadette Mathis sat down at the bar of a restaurant called Liam's Steakhouse in the resort town of South Padre, Texas. It was a Friday night and she was there to have dinner with her new friend Donna, a tourist she had hit it off with the previous weekend while they were both drinking at this same bar. The 65-year-old court reporter was looking forward to the evening. She didn't have many friends outside of work, and Donna was someone who seemed to know how to have a good time. In fact, the last time they'd hung out, they had almost been cut off at the bar. Before Bernadette knew it, they had headed back to the community hot tub at her condo complex, and Donna ended up crashing in her guest bedroom. However, as Bernadette waited and minutes began to pass that night, there was no sign of Donna anywhere. Out of curiosity, she started asking around, seeing if any of the other staff remembered her. To her horror, Bernadette soon learned that Donna wasn't going to be coming to dinner that night. You see, as it turned out, her new friend wasn't at all who she thought she was. The most chilling revelation was yet to come, though, when Bernadette discovered just how close she had come to a horrifying fate. In the spring of 2018, things were coming together for 59-year-old Pamela Hutchinson. A couple of years earlier, she and her husband James had gotten a divorce after two decades of marriage, but now the dust had finally settled and she appeared to be thriving. Pam had always been a people person and never found it difficult to make friends. She was known for her high energy and fun-loving spirit and for being just a generally kind, trusting, and caring person. Her ability to strike up a conversation with pretty much anyone had also helped Pam a great deal in her professional life. For years, she had worked in car sales while she was still with her husband in Virginia Beach and was extremely successful at it. Following the divorce, Pam had moved to Bradenton, Florida, where she had spent a year or so renting an apartment while getting reacquainted with single life. Being someone who loved travel and anything to do with the outdoors, the city was perfect for her, particularly because of its proximity to the ocean. Fishing was one of her favorite pastimes, especially for deep sea catches like marlins. The move to Bradenton turned out to be exactly the new start that Pam needed. Her social media was filled with pictures of her having fun at local restaurants, hotspots, and at holiday events like St. Patrick's Day and the annual Christmas Boat Parade. By early 2018, she had decided to put down permanent roots. She found a condo and put in an offer at the end of March. Fresh off this excitement, on April 3rd, Pam traveled about 90 miles south for what was supposed to be a few days in the tourist hotspot of Fort Myers. It wasn't a vacation, per se. She was actually there to comfort a friend who had recently lost her husband. However, it was a place that she knew well so she decided to make the most of the situation. Based on a tip from another friend, she decided to stay at the Marina Village at Snug Harbor, a luxury timeshare condo complex located right on Fort Myers Beach. For the next couple of days, the 59-year-old enthusiastically documented her trip on Facebook. She posted about listening to live music from her room, watching sunsets on the beach, and joked that she would be coming back to Bradenton on one of the fancy yachts docked outside of her hotel. She was having so much fun, in fact, that staff at Marina Village weren't surprised when on April 6th, they got a call from Pam's room asking if she could extend her stay for the weekend. What neither Pam nor anyone else knew, though, was that her impromptu getaway was about to come to an abrupt and terrifying end. Sadly, she wouldn't be returning to her new home at all. On the evening of April 9th, Lori Russell, manager at the Marine Village Timeshare Complex, was in the middle of a routine maintenance call when she came across something that unsettled her. After receiving a report about a possible water leak in the building, she had been inspecting units to try and pinpoint the source when she encountered a foul odor in room 404. For a few moments, Lori thought that she had found the problem and that perhaps the smell was part of it. 
Maybe it was sewage, she told herself. Still, despite this, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. So before going too far inside the unit, she went back out into the hall and asked two male guests to accompany her. None of them were prepared for what happened next. In the bathroom of room 404, they would stumble across the body of a woman. She was lying on the floor, and it was obvious that she was dead. When investigators arrived a short time later and began to process the scene, two things became disturbingly clear almost immediately. The deceased woman had been here for several days, and her death had been no accident. Thanks to the complex's rental records, it didn't take long to figure out the identity of the victim. It was Pam Hutchinson. At the time that she was found, Pam was lying on her right side and a towel had been draped over her. There was blood all over the bathroom floor, as well as a pink camouflage baseball cap close to her body. Closer examination revealed the source of the blood. It was a gunshot wound to Pam's chest. A 22 caliber bullet was recovered at the scene, though sources seem to contradict each other as to where exactly it was found. Some say it ricocheted off of a surface after hitting the 59-year-old and was extracted from the ceiling, while others state it was discovered lodged in the right cup of her bra. Regardless, the shot had been fatal. Detectives theorized that Pam had been killed sometime after April 6th, when she had made the phone call to the hotel's front desk, extending her trip. Other clues at the scene seemed to reveal more about what had happened. Pam's toothbrush was still in the sink of the bathroom, while a pillow with burn marks and a hole in it had been on top of her body. Since she also had no defensive wounds, detectives theorized that Pam's attacker had caught her by surprise while she was brushing her teeth, and that the pillow had been used as a makeshift silencer. The improvised silencer wasn't the only thing that the culprit had used to try and avoid detection, however. When Pam's body was discovered, towels had been stuffed under the bathroom door, and the thermostat in the room had been turned down to 61 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16 degrees Celsius. Both of these measures were obvious attempts to slow down the spread of any odor, so that the murder would go undetected for as long as possible. On the kitchen counter in the room, detectives noticed that Pam's purse had been rifled through. Several items were missing, most notably her wallet, cash, and all of her ID. While this meant that robbery could have been a motive, there were no signs of forced entry to the door or any of the windows. These clues, plus the lack of any sign of a struggle, all seemed to point to a single chilling conclusion. Pam Hutchinson had known her killer. The question now was did detectives know enough to find them? Following the discovery of Pam's body, detectives began their investigation by reaching out to those closest to her, hoping they might be able to offer some clues as to what had happened. However, friends and family members were stunned and heartbroken at the news of the murder. As far as they knew, Pam had no enemies, and they couldn't think of anyone who would do something like this. After learning about her divorce, authorities went to speak with her ex-husband James, thinking this might be a potential lead. He too was quickly cleared as a person of interest though, when police were able to confirm that he was hundreds of miles away during the window of time the crime took place. He was also genuinely devastated to hear about what had happened to Pam. With all of the usual suspects ruled out, so to speak, detectives turned their attention to a new tactic. Using the surveillance cameras at the Marina Village timeshare complex, they would attempt to retrace Pam's steps. Investigators started by reviewing the footage from the afternoon of April 3rd, when Pam had first arrived at the hotel. The video showed that Pam had checked in just before 3.45 p.m., she had spoken with the manager, paid with a credit card, and had gone back out into the parking lot briefly to grab several things from her car, which she then took up to room 404. Right away, detectives noticed something interesting about the footage. A number of the items that Pam had with her when she checked in were nowhere to be found. This included the credit card she had paid with, several pieces of jewelry she was wearing, and the car that she was driving, a white Acura. 
A description of the vehicle was immediately put out by police in the hopes that a member of the public might recognize it, and authorities also began working to obtain Pam's banking records. The fact that even more things had been stolen from the 59-year-old than detectives had initially realized seemed to solidify their theory of a robbery gone wrong. However, details of the crime scene still bothered them. Particularly, why had there been no sign of forced entry to Pam's room? And how had the perpetrator managed to ambush her? It was while mulling over these questions that detectives got a promising lead from one of Pam's friends, the one who she had come to visit in Fort Myers in the first place. The woman told investigators that on April 5th, Pam had mentioned that she was planning to have dinner with a woman she had struck up a conversation with the previous night. The woman was a fellow traveler, and she and Pam had hit it off. As luck would have it, police were pretty sure that they knew where this dinner had taken place. Among the scattered items that had been left behind from the ransacking of her purse was a receipt from a restaurant close to Marina Village called the Smoke and Oyster Brewery. The receipt was from the night of April 5th. Like Pam's hotel, it turned out that the restaurant also had surveillance cameras, and they were able to hand over video from the night in question. When authorities combined footage from the two establishments, they began to piece together a disturbing timeline. As detectives continued scrolling through the surveillance footage they collected, it didn't take long for them to find what they were looking for. It seemed that Pam had indeed been hanging around with a mysterious stranger in the lead-up to her death. The woman had grayish-blonde hair and looked to be around the same age as her. Just like her friend had said, it appeared that Pam had met this woman on the night of April 4th, the day after she arrived at Marina Village. Video taken from the hotel's lobby at 8.12 p.m. that night showed them chatting in the ground floor lobby before getting into an elevator and heading up to Pam's room. The next evening, surveillance cameras from the Smoke and Oyster Brewery showed that Pam had arrived sometime after 5 p.m. She sat at the bar and waited for a short time before waving to someone just out of sight. As the person stepped into frame, police recognized her as the same woman from the night before. She sat down, the two had a meal together, and it appeared that they were having a good time. One detail that jumped out to detectives as they reviewed the footage was that Pam was wearing the same pink camouflage hat that was found next to her body at the crime scene. Just after 7.35 p.m. that evening, Pam and the mystery woman left the restaurant and walked back over to Pam's resort. Cameras showed them entering her room together approximately 10 minutes later, and at about 8.34, the woman left and went back into the hall. She lingered outside by the hallway balcony railing for about 15 minutes, which authorities felt was a little odd, but eventually she walked to the elevator and got inside. Based on their working timeline of the case up until this point, investigators expected to comb through at least an additional day or more's worth of footage, which they hoped would reveal what had happened to Pam after April 6th. However, as they watched, they realized that they had made a mistake. At 10.30 p.m. on April 5th, roughly two hours after she left, the mystery woman returned to room 404, carrying a plastic grocery bag. This time, she would stay for a little under eight hours, emerging at 6.09 the following morning. From there, authorities watched as the woman made numerous trips back and forth from Pam Hutchinson's room, taking several bags and other luggage with her as she went. Other cameras at the resort revealed that the woman had taken these items to the parking lot, where she had loaded them into Pam's white Acura. She made the final trip at 8.30 a.m., after which she was captured driving off. The phone call to the front desk asking to extend Pam's stay had been made just moments before the mystery woman exited her room for the last time. However, Pam was never seen again on video after returning from dinner the previous night. Chillingly, it appeared that this woman had actually been the one that had made the call. Pam, investigators realized, was already dead. When detectives took a second look at the surveillance video from the previous night, they noticed something that they had overlooked before. 
during the 15 minutes when the mystery woman was standing by the hallway balcony. She looked incredibly distressed. Perhaps, they theorized, she was trying to come to terms with the fact that she had just committed a murder. While investigators now had a prime suspect, they had no idea who she was, nor what her exact motives were. Yes, it was clear that she had stolen a lot from Pam Hutchinson, but why go to such elaborate lengths to befriend her and earn her trust for what was essentially a brutal robbery? Worse still, because of the steps the woman had taken to conceal the crime, she now had a nearly week-long head start on investigators. Luckily, the surveillance footage revealed one final promising clue for detectives. Before stealing Pam's Acura, the mystery woman had been captured on video driving a second vehicle, a white Cadillac Escalade. Though she had moved it from the parking lot before leaving, based on the time she was gone and the fact that she had returned to Marina Village on foot, investigators knew that it had to be somewhere close. They were soon proven correct when after putting out an all-points bulletin, the SUV was found at a park about a mile down the road from the resort. When police ran the vehicle's information, they were stunned by what they found. The SUV was linked to another crime. Only this one had happened roughly 1,600 miles away. On the evening of March 23rd, 2018, just over two weeks before the discovery of Pam Hutchinson's body, police were called to a residence in the small town of Blooming Prairie, Minnesota. They had been asked by friends and family members of 54-year-old Dave Reese to conduct a welfare check on him, as he hadn't been seen for several days. When officers arrived at the rural property, they received no answer at the front door. The home was mostly dark, but when they began walking the perimeter, they noticed some lights that appeared to be coming through a window in one of the rooms. When the officers went to take a closer look, they were met with a grisly sight. Lying on what was clearly the bathroom floor was the body of a man. After backup was called in from the local Dodge County Sheriff's Office, it was quickly revealed that the remains belonged to Dave Reese. Analysis showed that he had been shot twice with a 22 caliber handgun, and judging by the level of decomposition, he had been there for several days at least. Towels had also been used to partially cover his body. News of Dave's death spread quickly, stunning residents of Blooming Prairie. As a quiet town of less than 2,000 people, locals weren't exactly used to crimes of this nature, and moreover, the 54-year-old seemed an unlikely target. Ever since moving to Blooming Prairie in 2005, Dave Reese and his family had seemed to fit right in. He and his wife, Lois, had three children and five young grandchildren, and had become beloved members of the community. For years, Lois had run a daycare out of their home, while Dave had built a thriving waxworm farm business. He ran the company out of a second building on their property, selling the worms as fishing bait to a number of businesses in the area. Through the business, Dave had become especially well-known around town. He hired friends as well as young people in their late teens and early twenties, and made a point of treating his employees well. To many, he became like a second father. One source described him as like Santa Claus in the summer. He was generous always had a way of making things fun, and was known for his infectious laugh. When he wasn't working, Dave could be found shooting pool with friends at one of the two businesses in town that had a table. As a former Navy man, he also volunteered at the local servicemen's club, where he and Lois often ate dinner. Lois was quite the social butterfly herself. She had a large group of friends, took part in the local bowling league, and also liked to organize trips to Diamond Joe, a farm-themed casino less than an hour away from town, just across the state border into Iowa. Given the Reese's reputations, it initially seemed inconceivable that someone could have a reason to harm them. However, it wasn't long before the situation got even darker. You see, after the discovery of Dave's body, authorities realized that no one knew where Lois was either. For a brief moment, there were fears that perhaps she had been the victim of a kidnapping. 
But then, police began to hear murmurs that pointed them in an entirely different direction. While interviewing the employees of the Waxworm Farm, detectives learned that no one had seen Dave since March 12th, a full 11 days before his body was discovered. That Monday morning, Lois had come down to inform them that Dave wasn't feeling well and was going to spend the day up in bed at the house. The situation stayed the same for the rest of the week, with Lois saying that Dave was still recovering. By Friday, some staff members were starting to get suspicious. They knew that Dave had stomach issues, but this was the longest he had ever been away from work. He was still sending texts, though these too felt out of the ordinary. Dave normally dictated all of his messages, meaning that the sentences often ran together. Suddenly, though, all of his texts had perfect punctuation. Before anyone could say anything, though, Lois told staff that she had taken Dave to see a doctor, and there was good news. He had been cleared to participate in a fishing tournament in Illinois that he had been excited to attend. For a moment, everyone's minds were put at ease. That was, until March 22nd, when someone saw Lois leaving the driveway of her and Dave's home by herself in an SUV. That SUV was Dave's white Cadillac Escalade, and it was the vehicle he was supposed to have taken when he left for his fishing trip two days earlier. After learning about Lois Reese's suspicious behavior prior to the discovery of her husband's body, detectives with the Dodge County Sheriff's Office began to try and locate her. It wasn't long before they received their first credible tip. They were told they should look for her at the Diamond Joe Casino. Though many had been hesitant to say initially, authorities soon learned that Lois Reese had a major gambling problem. Over the years, she had blown huge sums of money on slots and other games, including a $500,000 inheritance from her late father. When that money had run out, she had turned to more nefarious means of getting cash. On more than one occasion, she cleaned out savings accounts that she and Dave were supposed to be using to put funds aside for large purchases. And in 2016, she nearly faced criminal charges when she stole more than $100,000 from her own sister after she had been appointed her legal guardian and financial conservator following a mental health crisis. Sure enough, when detectives contacted the Diamond Joe Casino, they learned that Lois had been there on the night that her husband's body had been found. Unfortunately, she had since left. The only other clue authorities were able to find came from a convenience store not too far from the casino. On that same evening, while purchasing a sandwich, Lois had asked the clerk there if taking Interstate 35 was the best way to travel south. By this point, she had also stocked up on money, cashing three checks totaling $11,000 that she had embezzled from Dave's business. With nothing but a vague idea of the direction Lois was heading, it seemed like this might be the place where Dodge County investigators lost the trail. However, it was at this point that they caught a lucky break. They received a call from their law enforcement counterparts in Fort Myers, Florida, inquiring if they knew anything about Dave Reese's stolen SUV. When detectives in Minnesota and Florida learned about the shocking similarities between Dave and Pam's murders, they were extremely alarmed. The cases were officially connected a short time later when Dodge County investigators were able to confirm that Lois Reese was the mystery woman from the surveillance footage taken at Pam's hotel. Understandably, there were fears that since Lois had already killed twice, that she might not hesitate to do it again. Fortunately, this is when the banking information that police in Fort Myers had requested started to come through. The records showed that Lois Reese had been quite busy since Pam's murder. Not only that, but authorities now felt they finally understood why Pam had been targeted. Lois had been looking for someone close enough to her in appearance that she could steal their identity. On April 6th, just hours after Pam's murder, surveillance footage revealed that Lois had withdrawn $5,000 from her Wells Fargo account. By the time Lois stopped for the night at another hotel about 200 miles north in the city of Ocala, 
She was wearing Pam's clothes, sunglasses, and hat. She used Pam's credit card to pay for the room and even collected points for the stay on the dead woman's rewards card. Because police knew what vehicle Lois was driving, they were able to use this to partially track her journey. They followed her trail as she left Florida, briefly cut through Alabama, and went into Louisiana. It was here, while stopped at another casino, that she ironically won a $1,500 jackpot while playing the slots. Unfortunately for Lois, her windfall came in too little and far too late. Within days of Pam and Dave's murders being connected, the public had been put on high alert and was only a matter of time before she was caught. On April 19th, 2018, nearly six weeks after her crime spree began, Lois Reese was finally arrested at a bar called The Sea Ranch in South Padre Island, Texas. She had been recognized by the manager of the restaurant next door, who called police after realizing who she was. Much to the surprise of detectives, Lois didn't try to put up a fight when police came into the bar and surrounded her. Without a word, she allowed herself to be placed under arrest and reportedly showed no emotion, a sharp contrast to the way that she had been casually chatting with people and enjoying herself mere moments before. A search of Lois's room at a local motel revealed numerous items belonging to Pam Hutchinson, including her jewelry, identification, clothes, and car keys. Police also discovered two handguns, one of which, a 22 caliber, was believed to be the weapon she used in both of the murders. Detectives were even more disturbed when they spoke to countless people who had interactions with Lois Reese, who had been going by the name Donna, during the time that she was hiding out in South Padre. It turned out that she had befriended multiple women, most of whom, like Pam Hutchinson, were around her age and traveling alone. Investigators were convinced that she was searching for her next victim and may have been looking for someone with a passport so that she could flee the country, given South Padre's proximity to the Mexican border. It's disturbing to think what might have happened had detectives not arrested Lois before her second dinner date with Bernadette Mathis, the woman we mentioned at the beginning of this video. Following her arrest, Lois Reese pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in two separate trials in 2019 and 2020. She was sentenced to life at the end of both proceedings, first for the murder of Pam Hutchinson and then for the murder of her husband, Dave. At the time of this recording, she remains incarcerated in Minnesota. Honestly, originally I was just going to end the video here since I've been writing for close to 14 hours at this point and my brain feels like mush, but after reading this through multiple times, I felt like a couple of things were still left unsaid. As a disclaimer though, please feel absolutely free to skip this part. Personally, I think I'm about to head over a cognitive cliff and I can't promise the following armchair analysis will be any good. Anyway, what's been eating away at me is the whole why behind this story, particularly as it concerns what caused Lois Reese to go from a beloved mother and grandmother to a double murderer. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem as though a satisfying answer was really ever given. Most of the sources we came across cited her gambling addiction, theorizing that she killed Dave because he cut her off financially and things just sort of spiraled from there. This seems to be the prevailing opinion, as even before her arrest, the media had given her the nickname Losing Streak Lois. While I would agree that addiction likely played a role and may even have been the trigger, I would argue that the gambling itself was probably a manifestation of other deeper underlying issues. We mentioned earlier that Lois became her sister's guardian following a mental health crisis, but apparently she was far from the only person with documented mental health issues in the family. According to reports, her older sister, who was diagnosed with depression, deliberately ran over her own adult son during an argument about a year after Lois's arrest, and their mother apparently struggled with hoarding behavior throughout her life. So perhaps Lois was suffering some sort of acute manic episode. Indeed, there were reports of Lois exhibiting strange behavior well before she ever committed murder. 
For instance, two years prior to killing her husband, she disappeared out of the blue for three days. Understandably worried, Dave reported Lois missing, only to have her return and say that it was no big deal. She had just been visiting a friend in Minneapolis. A year earlier, she also nearly died after randomly overdosing on pain pills. While I'm not exactly sure what to make of this loose collection of anecdotes, what they say to me is that Lois hadn't been okay for a long time before the tragedy that prematurely ended two lives and negatively affected countless others. Still, it's hard to look past the cold calculation that seemed to permeate all of her actions, the way that she appeared to effortlessly be able to gain the trust of others while also betraying them with such brutality. If her own statements are to be believed, it seems that Lois's decisions were a mystery even to herself. While apologizing to friends and family members during her second sentencing hearing, she made this cryptic statement. Quote, I feel I need to say this. I didn't know how much pain I was in until I wasn't anymore. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.